All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is chapter five. We're going to look at groups and structure and social interaction um, and just really talk about what do these groups mean in our lives and how do we define them and, and uh, how important is work to us? How important are our small friend groups? How important is school or the big picture of groups of people that we meet at school and how intimate are those and what are our experiences like? You know, how do the all those things shape us? All right, first question. Have you ever worked for a fast food restaurant? Uh, yes or no? Um, and did you consider your experience at that job to be best job, worst job, so-so, scarred you for life? <laughs> um, all right, a lot of people um, have worked at uh, fast food restaurants. A lot of people have not. I oftentimes ask my class, do you think that Olive Garden is a fast food restaurant? Like, is Olive Garden fast food? And inevitably, we are split right down the middle. Um, a lot of people are like, no. And why would that be is what I would ask. And folks are like, well, because I tip, because I sit down, um, because you can drink alcohol. And why? Yes. Uh, I know how the food is prepared because uh, my partner worked there for many years. A lot of it is frozen and then just boiled in bags or in microwaves reheated. The food tastes the same every single time. Um, they need to get it out to you fairly quickly. Anyway, in a lot of ways, Olive Garden is exactly fast food, and in a lot of ways, it's not. But when we look at it as sociologists, we talk about the McDonaldization of society. Um, so what is meant by that? The rapid increase to fast food change, non-fast food organizations mimic the organizational principles of McDonald's, or Disneyland and Disney World are becoming increasingly popular worldwide. Look, once they added acres and acres of Star Wars, C is definitely correct. And why oh, all this had to go down before I could actually get out there to enjoy it is another thing that I will have to live with. However, that is not what I'm looking for here. I'm looking for B. Non-fast food organizations mimic the organizational principles of McDonald's. That just doesn't have to be food. It could be any place that focuses on making it the same every time, getting it out to people in a certain way, you know, streamlining it in those ways. Um, but now, of course, that does go to other restaurants as well and food places. So when we look at the McDonaldization of society, it really has big ideas and big pictures and some interesting thoughts about how groups work, how work works, how these institutions carry on in our society. All right, so social groups. Let's just start off with that. Two or more people who identify and interact with one another. Good, basic sociology, right? Groups contain people with shared experiences, loyalties, and interests. And I mean, not every collection of individuals forms a group. We might, we might just think that everybody in one spot might be a group. But if you look at this original definition, who identify with one another and who interact with one another, okay? So we can be in round large groups of people and not actually be a social group as we define it in terms of sociology, i.e. not every collection of folks forms a group as we know it. All right, so social groups. Social groups have to have status in common for starting, right? Could be people identify as a gender, female, women, Catholics, bird watchers, right? Uh, those things are really categories to most. I mean, you don't know most other bird watchers. You don't know most other Catholics likely. Um, and you are, you know, strangers to each other for the most part. So if we're going to look at it that way, then we're going to look at that as a category. Okay. I think that makes sense. Students at a CSU game, let's look at that as a crowd. Okay. Um, and that's interaction is limited. So you're there for a reason. You're there just to go to the game, you know, and it's a loosely formed collection of people in one place. Um, so students at a CSU game, crowd, maybe even when we're talking about like students in a social class, because although it can turn into a group, I mean, you could sit next to somebody for four months in a classroom and never even know that person's name, not know anything about them. You don't ever really interact with that person except for to come to class and listen to a lecture or whatever that might be. So categories, one definition, crowd, right? Another definition. And certainly a crowd 
could turn into a group with the right conditions, you know, um, Occupy Wall Street, right? When that was the movement several years ago that really took a look at, I think, one of the most important things facing or challenges facing this nation and the globe, really, but that's economic inequality. And then all of a sudden people saw this and they attached themselves to it and they turned that crowd into a group with a purpose. Same can be said right now for the protests that are going on in regards to the BLM movement. Um, power failures, right? Uh, maybe people are like reaching out to people in their neighborhood because then they need to. Um, same kind of thing, right? They need to bond with strangers. Suddenly there's a need for us to know or work and interact with people on a more intimate level. So one of the things I love about sociology, latent and manifest functions, achieved and ascribed status, is that we really do break it up in a simple way to be able to understand things. Um, and I think that that's helpful. So we're going to look at the two most important types of groups, and that's primary groups and secondary groups. Okay. So primary, a small group whose members share personal and lasting relationships. Okay. So size of the group is really important. They share lasting relationships that go on for a while, and they're very personal and intimate. You know a lot about each other, or at least you know quite a bit about each other. Secondary groups, on the other hand, very different, okay? So large group, so the size of the group from going very small to very big, and personal, whose members pursue a specific goal or activity. And oftentimes, um, work might be that kind of thing. Let's say you have some work study, and you're working with somebody in one of the cafeterias or the kitchens or whatever. It's a lot of people working there. It's fairly impersonal. And you're there really to pursue that goal of, you know, making some money, although you might find out something about somebody in the meantime. All right, let's dig a little bit deeper into primary groups. I actually have water in my glass. A lot of times I'm pretty sure that during those interview segments on late night and other things, people just pick up the mug because they need something to do, but that there's no actual water or beverage in it of any kind. Anyway, primary groups are groups in which people spend a great deal of time together. Your family, right? You're personal. You're tightly integrated. You know how things need to work and what the rules are of that group. Um, members think of that group as an end in itself um, rather than as a means to an end, right? Meaning, what do I get out of this? Which is oftentimes secondary groups, a lot of that. Primary groups, not necessarily so. In, in primary groups, members look at each other as unique and irreplaceable. I mean, and you might be stuck, you know, like with your family, that might not be great, um, or it might be. But the idea is that even if you fight once a month with your siblings, your parents, you think of yourselves as we, okay, like a unit and a small, tight knit, very personal um, unit of folks. Secondary groups, uh, those relationships involve weak, involve weak emotional ties, usually don't know much about each other, and really it's what they are or what they can do for each other rather than who they are. Meaning, okay, so like if you ask somebody to cover your shift at work, what's one of the things that you kind of think of right away that you know that's not a primary group? Yep, and that's if I cover your shift, you're going to owe me one, right? I mean, you could try and do that in a family, but there's just so many instances of interaction that, I mean, your list of who would owe who would just be so ridiculous and long and, and convoluted. You wouldn't have any idea. But you know, you cover that person's shift, then therefore there's an expectation that they will cover your shift sometime. So what can they do for you? Includes a lot more people than primary groups. Passage of time, certainly just like a crowd changing into a group. Um, a, it can transform a group from secondary to primary. Maybe that's a small knit group of athletes. You've got five people and you got to work together and you spend enough time together or you're in a band. I've been playing in a band since I was 16, been in a band that I'm in now for like 15 years. We're absolutely a unit. We know a ton about each other, about each other's families. And it's not, what can you do for me? It's this thing, this we, whereas in secondary groups, Members really don't think of themselves as we, okay? So let's break this down. Primary group, personal orientation, long duration, broad relationships involving many activities. And the goal 
is the end itself. Secondary groups, you focus on the goal. Get this job done, do this thing, work together to do whatever it is. Variable duration, oftentimes it's short term. Narrow relationship involving few activities, and it's a means to an end, right? It serves a purpose for you that is somehow different than or above just the relationships, right? Good. All right. So here's a great example of a primary group. Oh, my gosh. That's when my beard didn't have any gray in it. That's when Zion, my little guy, oh, he's even got short hair. Um, wow, long time ago. And then my dad, right? My dad, I, I thought he was taller than me for a long time. Uh, but that's, again, a, a while back, but awesome. And then our band's first show at Red Rocks, not a real success, but still, no, I'm just kidding, right? You know you can go to Red Rocks because it's a park anytime. A lot of people there working out, climbing stairs, having picnics and lunches and stuff like that, um, at least in the past anyway. So there's my family when the boys were little. and So that's a good example of a primary group. You're just, you're together, right? Here's a great example of a secondary group. What can you do for me? What am I going to do for you? We're absolutely going to keep tabs. We know of each other, but we don't do a lot of things together. And this could be any type of work scenario, but family, right? Primary, secondary. I think these are good examples that give us a, a, a really good idea. So for yourself, which would you like? More primary relationships, more tight-knit relationships, about the same number, or fewer primary relationships? Just got a lot of close friends as it is. I'm very tight-knit with multiple groups. Um, less would be good for me. And depending on who you are and what your experiences are with socialization and where you're at, um, you know, could be you could answer all of these things. I know there's a lot of people that come to college here that leave their traditional group of friends that they've had for a while in high school and they restart, they just reboot, and that's a and that's you will find a really important time in your life when you'll make a whole nother amazing group of friends, right? So maybe at this point you're a freshman, you need more, or you're a senior, you've had things dialed in for a while, you've, you've got what you need, and A B A ABBA or A B C. All right, group conformity. So I've got a link here, and um, I, I would ask how many of you have heard of the Stanley Milgram shock test? Most hands go up. Stanley Milgram doing research back in the day and wanting to look at group obedience and group conformity and how do we get people, because we talk about social control all the time in sociology, how do we get people to do what we want, even if it's contrary to their beliefs or, or what they would do? How do we see authority? Like what people in your life obey authority all the time, which people are very suspicious and do not obey authority well. Anyway, so I have a question here and there's there's the link. Would you kill or seriously injure a complete stranger if you were told to do so by an authority figure? Um, all right, that gets us to, right, the Stanley Milgram thing. Now the Stanley Milgram piece is, he has people come in. He's got a fake shock generator. You can see there in the upper right-hand corner. And it's got voltage all the way from whatever, very light voltage all the way through, you know, 350 volts or 400 volts or however many. And he asks somebody a pair of questions. So in the top left, that's the person who's going to be the teacher or doing the shocking. And he is looking in at least at the person who's going to be shocked sitting down. And of course, he's there with somebody in a lab coat, right? And we know that people who wear white coats are authorities. <laughs> Recently in the news, it's been a really interesting group of doctors who believe all sorts of strange things, not medically related. But as long as they stand there in front of the cameras with their white lab coats on, we should trust them. And this is what Milgram was talking about. How far will you go from somebody that you just met, right, with a clipboard and some questions and uh, dealing out learning, right, uh, or punishment to somebody who's going to be the learner? You don't even know them. How far would you go? Especially if you thought, you know, that you were hurting them, right? Okay. So let's let's do group conformity here. And that's just quickly. Groups influence the behavior of their members, promoting conformity. Even strangers can encourage group conformity. And how far will ordinary people go in obeying orders? That was really his thing. 
right? So he tells male subjects they'd be taking part in the study of the effects of punishment or how punishment affects learning. You're the teacher, the learner's in the other room. You see them, but they're strapped sort of into an electric chair of sorts with electrodes on their wrist, and they're strapped in to prevent movement while they're being shocked, right? So you know right away that you're or you think, because that's not really true, that you're shocking them, okay? You sit down, and then 50 volts, 300 or 450 volts, and the teacher reads a pair of words, so Batman or Robin? And that person in the other room says, Robin. And that person says, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that's clearly wrong, and presses the first one, 15 volts. The person in the other room is, ah, ouch. And then, right, you are asked to read another pair, CSU or CU. That's right. Quite clearly, it's not CU. It's not even Boulder, nowhere near it, <laughs> right? And so then out, you go up to 30 volts or 100 volts. And look, here's what happens. You wait a second. If the learner's wrong, obviously, they rig that. You apply the shock. And eventually, people are like, ah, stop. And you can't see them, but they're begging you to stop, pleading with you, right? And the people that were shocking them, the teachers, they're definitely struggling with that. but. What we found out is, and of course, I asked this question just a minute ago, would you kill somebody if a person of authority told you to? We said no. Most of us say no, absolutely not. But Milgram found out, and of course, research that would likely get you sued nowadays. Um, but two thirds of the people involved went all the way to 450. Not two thirds like went to 100, went all the way and had at least the idea or the notion that they might be killing that other person. I mean, you're just making a little bit of money in there to participate in the study. That, that is certainly not worth that, but the person in the white coat is like, please keep going, please keep going, press that button, you're here for a reason. They're not forcing them, but their perceived authority is making them conform, right? So what's it mean? People are likely to follow the directions of not only legitimate authority figures, but groups of ordinary individuals. I mean, even when it means harming another person, for as much as we like to think that we are independent learners and human beings with minds of our own, um, we obey authority. And we do so fairly willingly. Milgram's research certainly showed that, and we've seen other research which shows the same. That gets us here into this group think. Um, or group conformity. So groupthink, great test question and so um, term. The tendency of group members to conform resulting in a narrow view of some issues. And I have here 2003 invasion of Iraq. I mean, we said there were we weapons of mass destructions, WMDs, WMDs. We're going to find them. They're there. They're there. They're there. Really, you know, we wanted to show them the WMDs. We wanted them to be there so that we could go in and our military could remove a regime, which no one's arguing could be very brutal at times. Absolutely. Um, and commit some, some war crimes to be sure. Um, and we use that for justification so that people would hear it enough and conform in this country and then support it. And then, of course, we went to war with Iraq. We never did find any weapons of mass destruction and we toppled um, you know, their government accordingly. Now, reference groups, okay? So that's group think, but reference groups. And we're all part of a reference group of some sort, right? So a social group that serves as a point of reference and making evaluations and decisions. Um, it's used to assess our own attitudes and behaviors, you know, will my family approve who I'm dating? Uh, I use my family as a reference group. Remember before when I said, did your parents not approve of somebody? And how did that stop you? Or did it not stop you from behaving a certain way? Most people are like, yeah, my parents didn't like that person. I hung out with them anyway. However, we still look to other folks that we respect, that we know as a reference, right? Groups we belong to, groups we do not. And I used that before in like a job interview, right? Um, maybe we dress up if we see how those people are going to be, what what might be required for that job. We assess that and we make an evaluation or decision to dress up when I go in there for that, you know, for that job and whatever that might be. Um, and that could be attitudes of behavior. Who am I dating? Should I engage in um, drug use, not alcohol and drugs because alcohol is a drug, but should I engage in drug use? Should I not? So reference groups. And now we get to in groups and out groups. So. This is really interesting because this is based, obviously, on our perception. Are you with us? Are you not? So an in-group, a social group towards which a member feels respect 
and loyalty. An outgroup, a social group towards which a person feels a sense of competition or opposition. I'm against them for some reason. They're not with me. And furthermore, we have valued traits, like our family has valued traits that that other family does not. I mean, my kids are good kids. They would never do something like that, right? Um, and, and we can take this in-group and out-group thing, and often human beings do, to kind of extreme measures, right? Tensions between groups sharpen a group's boundaries and give people a clear social identity. Yes, it does serve a function, right? Of course, according to structural functional thought, it's, it's good to know our boundaries. They're a different group than I am. This is my group. Here's another one. But oftentimes members of in-groups hold like way overly positive views of themselves and unfairly negative views of various out-groups. Oh, well, right? We, they really, in the Middle East, they really disrespect women. They force them to cover themselves. They don't give them as many rights. They purposely do that. So we don't do that here. Or we feel good about ourselves and where women's rights are in this country. However, we understand that everybody knows that women get paid 70 some cents to the dollar as every single person identifies them as a gender male. Same education, same school, same amount of uh, experience and even more in some cases. And yet it's easy to look at another culture in this frame of reference and say, yeah, they really do that to women. That's really bad, but we certainly don't. Um, we know though, however, that that's not necessarily true, right? Powerful in-groups can define other um, others as lower status or as an out-group, right? Um, and many white folks are members of dominant culture, peachish colored, freckled skin, however, your people of European descent, view people of color as an out-group and then act with racism, discrimination, and bias and, and purposefully institutionalize those laws which give them disenfranchisement and restrict their wealth and their really ability, their access and their power in society, right? So and I'll back up once. The next slide, you're all adults here. We're all in college. These, this is a slide of, uh, of during um, the Gulf War, right? These were pictures that were taken because they had turned over this jail scenario to people that were outside military contractors. So our military didn't even really know what was going on. Well, what was going on is members of these private military contractors and some members of our military were doing all sorts of awful. They were committing war crimes. They were hooking up um folks genitalia to be shocked. They were piling people like this, males, particularly that culture, to embarrass and shame and demean them, doing the same thing up here, especially when that's coming from a woman in, in a different culture. And so the idea of this is when is it in-group, out-group? When is it group think? And when is it torture or enhanced interrogation? Because we oftentimes say that those people torture or they commit war crimes and when we do it, it's enhanced interrogation. And I guess from a sociological standpoint, there's really no difference. You know, torture is torture. When you're using tear gas, you're not even supposed to use that on people in a time of war. When you turn it on your citizens, you know, you are committing crimes, same as the other. But because we view ourselves as the good guys or the in-group or whatever that might be, and they're the out-group, then we let that slide. Um, look, fairly quickly through chapter five, um, we've got a lot of things going on, so check in as frequently as you can. Let's drop that music hard. Mm, 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 mm. I don't even know. Is this the right kind of music? Even if it's not, let's just do it. Dooka, 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 dooka. Woo! In the club! All right. Anyway, be good people and do good things. And take care of everybody. Um, I'm having a fun time this semester, and I hope you are too. Reach out if you need anything. Yeah!